Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Trident University Marketing Specialist Daniel Sloan, and we're excited to be bringing you today's Culture of Research and Education webinar called Developing a Dissertation, Practical Tips for Success. The core webinar series is designed to provide faculty, students, and alumni an opportunity to share their research and scholarship with the Trident community. By fostering a culture of professional development and idea exchange, participants will have access to a valuable forum for lifelong learning. This university-wide effort is coordinated by Trident's doctoral studies directors. A few notes before we begin today's session. Welcome to ask questions at any time, share your experiences on today's subject matter. Although everyone's muted, We'll have time for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can send your questions and comments through the question box in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll get to everything, uh, like I said, at the end of the presentation. You'll also find a few helpful resources under the handouts on the control panel. These are pre prepared excuse me, by today's presenters. And as always, this webinar will be recorded, and all attendees will receive a link to the webinar and a copy of the slide early next week. Today's session can be hosted by Dr. Heidi Lynn Smith, Dean of Trident's College of Education. She joined Trident in 2014 as the director of the EDD program. She has over 20 years of experience in higher education and administration, including time at California State University Long Beach, where she launched that, launched that institution's EDD program. Dr. Smith earned an EDD in Community College Higher Education Leadership from CSU Long Beach, as well as Master's and Bachelor's degrees from San Diego State University. Her research interests include access, retention, and persistence of underrepresented college students, financial literacy of college students, and professional development of student affairs personnel. Welcome, Dr. Smith, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on developing a dissertation, Practical Tips for Success. This is the first of two webinars that offers a student perspective and a dissertation chair's perspective about how to navigate the development of a dissertation and how to work with your chair. I'd like to take a moment first to introduce you to our presenter. Dr. Allison Deegan serves as doctoral mentor in the Trident College of Education, where she focuses on guiding doctoral students to dissertation success. She's also the Associate Director of Write Girl, a highly acclaimed nonprofit that mentors teen girls through creative writing and is the Associate Editor on all of Write Girl's award-winning anthologies. Dr. Kamina, Dr. Cami Romanoff murphy is a private contractor of speech-language pathology, providing services to students across the U.S. via telecommunication platform. She also works part-time as a freelance academic editor and is an alumna of Trident's EDD and Educational Leadership Program. I know you're all eager to learn from both our presenters, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Romanock Murphy and Dr. Allison Deegan. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we're so happy you could be here to join us. The first thing I'll say um, is that I have very recently graduated from Trident University International, so I have very, very recently completed my dissertation. So no matter where you are in the process, I understand what you're going through, and I hope that through the information we give you today, you can come away with some practical tips and strategies that will support you on your journey. And that being said, we have so much we wanna say. There is so much to say about this topic, but we don't have tons of time. So we have provided you with some handouts that are very beneficial and we highly recommend that you download them. Um, they're full of great tips that will help you get through your dissertation even more smoothly. So today we would love for you to come out of this webinar knowing more about how to select a dissertation chair and how to work with them, how to develop strong academic writing skills and build your study and get the IRB approval, and also how to collect and analyze your data. And also, again, we'll be providing you with those take-home resources, which are absolutely wonderful. So our very first topic today, we'll talk about um, how you can go about selecting your dissertation chair. And so, what I would say first and foremost is put some careful thought into who you'd like your chair to be because it can, in my opinion, make or break your dissertation process. And my chair was amazing. It was Dr. Deegan, surprise, who we're working with today. And um, my biggest pieces of advice are to consider a topic match and also your chair's prior experience. So when I say that, I mean, 
I was looking for someone that had experience in the topic that I was studying. And so my topic was educational leadership. Dr. Deegan has a wealth of experience in educational leadership, but more importantly, I think as a doctoral student, many of us were writing a dissertation for the very first time. And so I was really looking for someone that could guide me through the dissertation process and kind of take me through all the steps as I was learning as an academic writer. So it was more important to me to have someone that could guide me specifically through a qualitative uh, study, which is what I chose to do. And Dr. Deegan has done that with many people. So I felt that that was very effective and it made my writing so much more efficient and I was able to learn a lot from her that way. And in terms of recommendations, I would recommend really putting thought into who you'd like your chair to be, but reaching out to them early. So as you're going through your doctoral classes, before you hit dissertation series, I would start thinking about the instructors you're working with and how you like their communication style, the feedback that they're giving you and your rapport with them, and kind of start taking some mental notes about if you'd be a good match and consider rapport. So when I was looking for a chair, I was really looking for great communication. I was looking for the topic match and prior knowledge, accessibility, and overall, just how we got along through our courses and the feedback that I was given as a student. Um, thanks, Tammy. And I would add that uh, one of the main components is how you're going to work together. You can discover that when you're in a class together, you get a sense of the professor and how the work flows, how their feedback flows, and see if that's a match for you. You don't actually need a topic match. Um, some students may be more comfortable there, but Virtually every professor that you'll encounter at Trident has, they've, they've gotten their own doctorate, they've gone through it at a minimum, and there is a case to be made for a newer chair who hasn't done a lot of it. They have a, a fresh perspective on it sometimes. Maybe they're closer to emerging methods versus somebody that has a standard approach in, in guiding their students. But I think the, the key is really uh, connecting on a work level, connecting on a process level, and feeling that sense of support. If it's somebody you don't know, you're interviewing them, basically. You're, you're trying to find out if your aspirations, the way they are at the moment, because you don't have your dissertation fully formed rarely when you select a chair. Um, your aspirations at the moment, how do they jive? What kind of feedback can you get even in a conversation about improving your study or the logistics of it or whatever? So the rapport is really number one in my book. And you should look for people that you have that comfort with. And know as well, you're going to fill out a committee with two or three additional people, and you'll have that sense of team. But the chair is going to be the one directing it, and that's the person that you need to connect with uh, the most deeply. And then the, the next thing we want to talk about is um, working with your chair. And to me, the, 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 the bullet point that's there first communication is the most important thing. No matter what, even if everything falls into line, this is gonna be a challenging process. Almost all of us are working, we have families, we have communities, we have all kinds of obligations. And the dissertation comes in on top of all of that. You can rarely stop the world to work on your dissertation. At least I wasn't able to do that. A few of my students can. And so communication becomes the most important thing in your relationship with your chair. I require all my advisees to remain in close contact with me Sometimes I have to chase after them, sometimes they have to chase after me, but if we lose touch and if a student is doing a common thing, which is deliberately hiding from that contact, from that communication, because they don't feel good about where they are in the process, we are in real trouble. So communication is number one. And the other thing that I really, really emphasize is the perception that you have to do the whole dissertation. It sort of slams down at you at various points, mostly at the beginning, but even throughout, you feel the weight of it. And you have to cling to that incremental progress. You have to be very clear to work with your chair. That's where the communication comes in. To map out these milestones, these things that you can say, this part is done. This part is attended to. This part we've made a decision on. And now all the other pieces can fall into place. Otherwise, you have that sense of all or nothing. And it's overwhelming. This is basically you're writing a book. And to say, write that book or you're not writing that book, doesn't really help you. you. Take it chapter by chapter, sometimes even paragraph by paragraph. That's where we have to go forward and set up milestones. You can also align it with milestones in your personal life. Well, when I when I get to vacation, I'll do this over the two weeks. Or when my kid finally goes to high school, I'll have more time to do this. Um, so the dissertation doesn't take place outside of your life. It has to be integrated in. You stay in communication. If you set up 
incremental points of progress and those milestones with your chair, that's a way to get through it. That's uh, more preferable than weighing the whole thing on your shoulders. Yeah, I completely agree. And I also agree that communication is key. I think it's really important in the whole dissertation process that you have a strong working relationship with your team. And I also think that it's important that you communicate early and often, but especially consistently. As a tip, I would say absolutely get on the phone with your chair. I think a lot of times we're scared as online students or we might feel intimidated getting on the phone for the first time with a professor that maybe we have never spoken with uh, verbally before. Everything is done over Microsoft Word or track, in track changes or email, but there is nothing more powerful than a phone conversation with your chair so you feel comfortable with it. It makes your writing so much stronger and you can gain so much more expertise by having a phone call rather than getting feedback via track changes. So I really found that it was beneficial to have a schedule as well. I like to check in with Dr. Dan every week, every two weeks. Um, of course, sometimes life gets in the way things happen, so you reschedule, but that can be And the uh, incremental progress. I I also agree with that. I think that a lot of people go into this rotation, so did I, I think a lot of people do, thinking how intimidating it is because you're looking at this massive piece of writing. But don't, don't do that to yourself because the fact of the matter is it happens in chunks. You, you set yourself writing goals and you do that with your dissertation chair, ideally, and you tackle those little goals and then all of a sudden one day you've got an, a proposal for IRB and then all of a sudden your data is there and then you've got a dissertation and then you look back and say, oh, I can't believe I did it. Well, you did it. How did that happen? <laughs> How did that happen? Because you were setting yourself little goals. Last bit of advice for me personally, I would also recommend setting yourself some personal goals, not just the dissertation goals because I feel it's really important to take care of yourself and strive for balance in your life when you're going through this because writing a dissertation is a challenge and it's not supposed to be easy I mean you're you're wanting to do something that is a challenge to change something in your life whether it's professional or personal or something that means something deeply to you but take care of yourself do things that you love to do take care of your health and fitness spend time with your family um, and carve out the time where you can Strive for balance when you can. It won't always happen, but take care of yourself. It's really important. And that brings us to our next topic that we'd love to speak with you about. So the importance of good writing. So I remember going into the doctoral program before I started and someone said to me that a good dissertation is a done dissertation. And so maybe you've heard that before and that's true to an extent because your dissertation has to get completed to finish your doctoral degree. But at the same time, it's such a sense of, of pride and there are so many resources out there available to you that will help support you to become a stronger academic writer. So first and foremost, don't get hard on yourself. Always look for a diagnosis, get help with your academic writing, use your classmates, your chair, the writing center resources, and even an editor if you're really struggling. I think that you can have a wonderful vision and you can have the best topic in the world but maybe you're not a strong academic writer. And, and remember that that's okay. Um, everybody has different levels of, of expertise when it comes to writing, but you are gonna grow with the guidance of your chair as a writer, you absolutely will. Um, we wanted to provide you some resources too. So again, check out your handout because there's excellent writing resources found out on there with all sorts of tips and, and uh, and dissertations you can look at and books that are great that will help you to become a stronger writer. And lastly, it is all about time. So we touch on this quite a bit, but it's true. Try to stay on track with your writing whenever possible. There are module assignments when you get to your dissertation series for a reason. So if those module assignments are having you create some sections about maybe consent and confidentiality or recruiting participants, try to get that done within the time frame that it's, it's due because you're building essentially your IRB application and then your study. And then I also recommend working between semesters once you get into it, into your dissertation series, because during the year you usually have two or three week breaks, you know, between semesters. But when you get to your dissertation series, look at that as bonus time. Get ahead whenever you can, because you don't know what struggles might come up or what barriers. I personally faced a couple of barriers with recruiting participants and then maybe um, the site that I was wanting to access didn't work right away. So working ahead, 
really helped me to kind of buy that extra time that I, I really needed. And I do think time is the watchword here. This is essentially a writing challenge. It can't be done otherwise. You can't just give a speech about your findings. You have to write them up in a, in a way that meets the standard and hopefully exceeds it so that it can go out into the world. So I like to tell all of my students that this is not a selfish, indulgent thing that you've cooked up and as a result, you're shirking responsibilities of your job or your family. It's actually a sacrifice to go through this work. We are trying to bring research to the field to make things better. No matter what your discipline is, our research is intended to help. So it's a very important endeavor. It's a community endeavor. It's a civic service, if you look at it that way. It's not something just for you. So that's the spirit in which I want you to be what I call a time warrior and try to steal, find, grab, or manufacture that time from everything you can. We tend to put our work last. I'll do it at night. I'll do it later. I'll do it all day Sunday. And Sunday your brain is fried, so you can't work Sunday and you can't get much done. So all the fantasies about time we're going to have in the future need to be replaced with realities about time that we have today. And I encourage you to take it in a smaller block as is feasible to get something done. Sometimes that's 15 minutes. You can read an article in 15 minutes. In a half an hour, you can look something up and, and go over a couple of pages. So steal the time wherever you can, be that time warrior, and know that you're working towards something important that's really valuable. And the, 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 the skill of saying no to others as obligations flow to you, like they always do, is not a selfish pursuit. It's actually um, devoted to your research and what you intend that research to, to do out in the world. So if I could give you a few words to focus on, their writing, definitely that's part of it, but the other four or five of them are time, 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 and time. This is mostly about managing your time so you can get that good writing, so you can come to those exciting conclusions and that analysis about your work. So just keep it focused on getting that time and taking it, and that will be the most important asset for your writing. Um, so let's talk next about how you build your study. Um, it starts in the most ideal version uh, with something you're passionate about, something at a minimum you're extremely curious about. And the reason those things are important is you have to sustain it over multiple years. In the EDD, it's going to be three or four years. In the PhD, maybe even longer. That You have to be living with this literature, living in this world, interacting with scholars who focus on this. And if you lose your passion for it, if you, you lose your interest for it, that's a really, really difficult challenge that's then thrown into a process that is already challenging. So the key there is to, to pick correctly, you know, to focus on something that you're passionate about. But paired with that, we have to be mind, mindful of what I call the doability of a study. A study has to be doable. If you can't get it done, it doesn't matter how brilliant it is. It doesn't matter how urgent or important it is. So we have to pair reality. That's where your chair comes in, where you map out how it could be done, what data you could get, how you could go forward, what the barriers are. If you pair that with your passion for a topic, I guarantee you we can find a way. We can find a way to, to, to get at that area that you're so passionate about and maybe hopefully that you even have some background in so you already know some of the literature, some of the process and we can elevate it to a really great study if we're mindful of passion and logistics. And you're also, Cammy will talk a little bit more about this, but you're on the hunt for something unique. That's not an easy thing to do. So we need to frame our study area, we need to frame how we could do it in terms of logistics, and we're always looking for something that hasn't been uncovered yet, word that road that isn't well treaded. You know, how we can find a true gap in literature that's hard to do, but maybe the people you ask, the subset of, of participants you interview, haven't been interviewed about this well mode topic already. So that's a way that you can get to a true gap. But doing those things give you give you give you that spark to sustain your passion in the in the topic, and it gives you a, a logistical way. Sometimes your logistics is the new way, is the gap through. So those are the things we look for as I as I consult with my students. Those are things we're always on the hunt for to build a study that's going to be worth all of this investment you're gonna put into it. Yeah, and when I was building my study too, of course with guidance, I but I knew I wanted to choose something that I was passionate about. And for me in particular, that was inclusive special education um, and educational leadership. So just know that this position is going to be your baby, you know, for the next one to however many years, depending on your program. 
but I recommend choosing a topic that you do care deeply about and something that drives you because when the going gets tough, you want to keep going and that passion will often do that for you um, when the writing portion is really maybe a little difficult. But again, be mindful of logistics. I think this is actually an Oprah quote, but and it's applicable in life, but also in your dissertation. So you can do anything, but you can't do everything. So just keep your study focused and be aware of maybe some of the potential logistical issues that you might face. But just, just keep it focused because once you get your doctoral degree, you can conduct independent research. So if you are so passionate about 101 topics or maybe quite a few topics pertaining to one specific thing you're wanting to research right now, you can do that down the line. But for now, keep it focused. Um, and keep it focused on the gap that might be in your literature. And some other things. My favorite saying is, that's a great study for Dr. Murphy, not a great study for student Murphy, because student Murphy has to get their dissertation done. Yeah, and it kind of comes back to a, done, a good dissertation is a done dissertation, right. and in that sense, you know, that, that is true if you want to get it done. Um, and then just, and I'll tell you about a couple other logistical considerations I had personally and that you might face. I was living overseas, I still am, if you can see, I'm in Germany and it looks very German, but I was in Italy when I did my doctoral uh, degree. And so I have to consider things like time, my location, my communication and access to participants because I wasn't working at the site that I was conducting my study with anymore. And so those are just all things that I was trying to think about when I was building my study. And last but not least, when you talk about finding a gap in the literature, uh, that is important. So I. I don't know about much about many of you, but for me, I always feel like if I'm not writing something down in my dissertation, I'm not getting something accomplished. I just felt like I had to be writing and getting things on paper to be getting things done. But that's that's not true. I think one of the most powerful pieces of this whole process uh, is spending time with the literature because you get to really know your topic and you can actually find that gap in the literature and become very, very focused. So just in hindsight, there's so much power behind that. So don't feel like you're losing time by spending time with the research and building your annotated bibliography because it's going to make you much more of an expert. It will make your study stronger. And so we're going to switch gears just a little bit here. And we'll be talking now about getting through the IRB process. And so I would say this process for me was one of the most challenging and exciting experiences in the dissertation process because it was the first real hurdle that I had to face because you're doing a lot of work on the front end before you submit to IRB. And the IRB is ultimately there to protect participants. So you want to go in with a cohesive paper. And so first of all, I wanted clarity in my, in my paper. I, I thought it was really important to have an application that was cohesive and my methodology was strong and my plan going in was strong too. So I recommend looking at the IRB guidelines and really following them and working closely with your chair to help guide you through that. I think something that was also very beneficial is Dr. Deegan tried to anticipate the IRB feedback before I submitted something. And that was very powerful because um, although it felt, again, like more work on the front end because there was feedback, there will always be feedback and there should be because you're learning. Uh, I had to fix things here and there. It was good because what can happen if you don't try to anticipate some of this feedback and go in with a cohesive argument or paper or proposal is that you might get feedback back from IRB because they're trying to protect participants and that can get you in a little bit of a time loop so just go in with the strongest uh, proposal that you can right off the bat rather than going back and forth making maybe some edits potentially um, and then in terms of timing and meeting high standards I suggest to submit your proposal ASAP be proactive because the earlier you submit your proposal, the more time you're going to have to collect your data, analyze your data, which is really, really powerful. But don't panic once you do submit that you're going to lose any time either because you're going to have plenty of time to work on Article 1 and Article 2 and maybe you're doing a project for Article 3. I don't know. It kind of depends on the structure of your dissertation, but you will have no lost time. So you'll have plenty to work on, I promise, in the meantime. Don't worry. Always more articles to read, no matter what. Um, the, the couple important points I want to say about the IRB, one is, although it is challenging, this is a hurdle we have to pass, we have to su submit our work and, and sit while they're judging what you're doing and give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. 
we cannot stray into viewing the IRB as something adversarial. They're actually our partners. And the role that they play is absolutely critical. The protection of research subjects is at the core of everything we do. And even if your study doesn't have any potential harm to research subjects, getting that approval is a certification that as a researcher, you're on the right track. As a researcher, you're already effacing very high standards and it bodes well for whatever data you may collect. So we have to, um, as I said, view them in partnership and take their feedback very seriously. The challenge that we have is the IRB uh, reviewer is not part of our team, right? They're not, they're not privy to all the intentions you have and all the plans you have and all the discussions we've had. So they have to look at only what is on the page. So things like consistency or even something as simple as a typo. If you say one hour and then later on you say two hours, the IRB reviewer doesn't know what you're going to ask of your participants because there's an inconsistency there. So they're sticklers for a reason. Their, their mission is really quite, quite uh, important in protecting, uh, potentially protecting research subjects. So we have to have, be clear, we have to time it right, give them enough time, but it's, it's in order for us to get the stamp that we need as researchers to go forward. And the standards that they impose, that the college impose, the university imposes, that your individual colleges impose, and the IRB themselves as a board and their policies as well as the reviewers are all part of that chain of protection of research subjects. And that, if we can't meet that standard, we have no business doing any research. So it's important, but it's another seemingly external facet as you plan out how you're gonna do something. And um, as Cami said, we, we have no um, downtime while we wait for IRB feedback and decisions. We're always looking at more stuff we're looking at. We're looking at um, literature, we're working on another part of the dissertation, so it shouldn't derail you. And if you're having significant issues with the IRB and the feedback keeps coming and you have to have multiple submissions, which happens sometimes, it's usually because of work you didn't do on the front end. So I try very hard to make sure we, we meet those standards before we even get to the IRB. That's, that's one way you can always keep it moving. Um, so next we want to talk a little bit about um, you and your data, once, once you get your data. It seems like it's a magical day when you have your data, but then, then the trouble begins. Then you have to analyze it, then you have to write up your findings, and then you move away from citing the work of others and you're really um, doing your own work, which is the most thrilling part, but in some ways the most challenging part. Um, the thing I want to talk about just briefly with, uh, with your data, as exciting as it can be, and you know, it's the thing where we're sort of aiming toward, um, then comes a shift in your relationship. Your reader has prior been your professors as you formed your, your topic and then ultimately your chair and your committee as you move more formally into dissertation and the IRB. But we're now aiming toward our reader. And, and I, this is why we ask uh, Trident students to identify potential publication sources for their dissertations to have read, um, read the places where you hope your work would land so that you have a keen sense of who your reader is and what your reader wants. And your reader may be an expert in the field, your reader may be a non-expert who's trying to um, glean some practical application of your work. So we have to be really mindful of that and we have to write our findings in a way that really reaches that reader. The dissertation is not an audience of one, you, or an audience of three, your, your committee. It's broader than that. And if you always think about your reader, I often tell students, put that post-it note on your computer that says the reader. We're always thinking about the reader. Um, you'll achieve the tone that you need and you'll achieve a place for your data to be understood. And just another thing about that is um, we always have a standard of honoring our participants. We're not here to expose them. We're not here to uh, uh, in inflict any emotional distress on them. And, and portray them as anything other than valued parts of our research journey, valued participants and contributors to the data that we have. So the way in which you pre present your data, especially those of you that are using qualitative data, the way in which you present those voices have to be true to your participants. We have to honor the time that they took, the things that they shared, some of which is very sensitive and very emotional, and how all of that comes together as a powerful piece of research and scholarship to ultimately improve, change, alter, or excite the field we're working in, it will always come back to the people who gave that time, who provided that data. And so I think if you think of them as you complete, as you write, and as you try to engage your reader, you'll, you'll be 
holding up those standards that we want that are really high for research. And just a little tip, um, if you're not a, a statistician, maybe you shouldn't do a complex statistical analysis for your dissertation. If you are a statistician, then you should. And your committee needs to have somebody who matches those skill sets. If, you, if you're interested in qualitative research or mixed methods or whatever, you've got to form a team that can support that. You can't just expect your chair to be able to do those complex things or to, or to do, uh, give, give, you, give you ideas about qual research and how to set that up if that's not their strength. So your research skills have to be well developed. This is not the time where you're going to learn those skills during the dissertation. With exception, I mean, you can learn a piece of software, you can learn a new analytical model that you haven't used before, but overall, you should frame how you approach the data and how you do the study from your research strengths. And I'd like to touch on the, this data conversation as well from the student perspective. So when we say always think about your reader, I think of that in the same way, but a little differently coming in from a student perspective in that I learned a lot. I, I learned a lot about data collection and analysis throughout this whole process because it was brand new to me too. Um, so I really learned to report data in a way that was accessible to participants. I I started out, I, I've always loved academic writing, but I would say that I had some long-winded sentences and I used more jargon, you know, and it wasn't, it just wasn't accessible. And so I learned to do things like keeping it simple, always thinking about your readers, speaking to them, using heading uh, to keep your focus and always tying your data back to your questions and your overarching themes so you don't go off on a tangent. You know, it was things like this that I couldn't have really practiced until it was time, until I had my data and it was time to apply everything that I was learning through my chair. So, and on and on honoring your participants, I, it is so important because without your participants, you don't have a study. And without your study, you don't have your dissertation. Without your dissertation, you don't have your doctoral degree. So, it's, I mean, it seems like common sense, but Treat your participants with respect. Communicate with them respectfully. Uh, keep them keep them safe. Keep them uh, confidential. And and so for my study, for example, I used uh, pseudonyms for the dis the district I was working with and anybody that was in my study. And I even masked some demographic data. And sometimes you'll have to do that because maybe the participant is very obvious if you don't mask some of that data. So just treat them with the utmost respect. And then um, something I did at the end too, and it a little goes a long way. Uh, it's just a gesture, but I sent thank you cards and I just thanked them for their time. And it seems like nothing, but to them that might've felt like something. And I really appreciated their time. So it's just small gestures like that, that can help them feel taken care of because they really are at the heart of your study. And analyzing your data, using your strongest skills. Um, Dr. Deacon said, if you're not a statistician, maybe maybe that's not the, the route to go, maybe, you know? Uh, that I put up my hand because by no means am I a statistician at all. And I chose to do my data uh, analysis in a way that suited my strengths. I love academic writing and I tend to be verbose and I wanted to be able to report my data in a way that supported my study, but it was very narrative, it was descriptive, I used quotes to back up my findings rather than the struggle I would have had trying to make sense of it to myself and my reader using more uh, stats. So anyway, <laughs> that would be my advice there. And so that brings us to one of our last slides, and that is the student and professor perspectives overall about completing. Dr. D, you take it away. <laughs> yes, I would say um, from a prof professor perspective, it, you know, as challenging as this process is, and I've never worked with students where it wasn't challenging, even when you think, oh, this is going to be smooth sailing, things happen. Your site lays off all the teachers you were going to interview, or you lose your job, or you have to move across the country, or a family member gets ill, things just happen. So it's never smooth sailing. Um, what I found is the academics is rarely the issue. It's the life. It's the management. It's the time. It's the being up to your neck in obligations and feeling like you're not doing any of them um, up to the standard that you hold for yourself. So that's the, the boat we're in as we go through this process. But that being said, you know, for me, I, I had my own dissertation process, which is very, very challenging, very struggling. And it, in, in part, it's the reason why I want to do this work, because I know what it's like. And it's just never been anything short of a privilege to work with students and just play a small part in getting this great 
research to the to the field, these great new ideas, the voices of these participants, or the or the the powerful uh, statistics that can really make a case for something. And ultimately, we're trying to change policy. We're trying to influence policy members. We're trying to influence uh, maybe our dissertation, or our, I mean, excuse me, our district supervisor or our, our principal or whatever. We're trying to be at the table where solutions are discussed. And from that case. How hard would you work for that seat? I think the answer is really, really hard. And um, that's what is exciting about me to be, for me to, to try to be part of that process and guide students through the best I can. But it ends up being a really significant partnership and the heavy lifting in retrospect. Sometimes I feel like it's me, but in retrospect, I always see um, what my students have put in and that is why their work is really compelling. So what you put in, you'll ultimately get out of it. And in terms of completing a dissertation and graduation, I think overall, I would still say, I mean, writing a dissertation is a challenge and it's one of the biggest I've ever faced professionally, but it was also one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Um, and I feel that do, writing a dissertation has made me more confident and competent as, as a, a writer, but also as a professional and as a human, you know, you develop these skills like resilience and dedication and tenacity, and they carry over to your real life as well. So I just think it's, it's one of the best things you can do for yourself. Um, and that being said, um, yeah, when I was at graduation just a couple of months ago, it was beautiful. It was in Cyprus. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And there is nothing like it. You walk across the stage, an auditorium is gorgeous. And they announce your name as Dr. Romanak Murphy. And that feels good. But then to have your friends and family all there with you and being able to share that, it's an experience I'll never forget. And it's absolutely worth it. You absolutely do it. And we're here for you. And you've got all sorts of support and resources to help you through the process. And just just one, one final note I can't, uh, can't end without reiterating about time. Time, time, time. The reader is one post-it note and time is the other post-it note have on your computer. And it's going to be a challenge till the end. But if you understand that that's what's happening, I'm out of time. I manage my time poorly. I have to say no. I have to do this as opposed to I can't do it, as opposed to I'm not good enough. Don't go into that space and recognize the realities of really what it is. It's a, it's a writing project, but it's a giant time management project. And if your team is aware of your challenges, we can work around them. I, I spoke with Cami for more than a year overseas. Mm -hmm. So we had to manage all those time differences and wacky WhatsApp that didn't work <laughs> and all kinds of things, but we make it work. Or when we were both traveling, so you can, you can manage the logistics, the time, and all of those pressures that they feed into the rest of your life if you're in that strong communication with your team. Yep, and just before we mention one last time the resources in the handouts, I will say too about common issues that do arise. Uh, I, I would echo what Dr. Deegan said about the time and prioritization that can happen because life gets in the way and life is busy. Um, but we have provided you with some resources and handouts, and one of those I highly recommend taking a look at actually talks about prioritization and time management because oftentimes we don't know those are actually struggles until we get to, you know, um, a priority of this enormity. Uh, so go check out that handout and there are all sorts of tips for time management and prioritization. There are books, there are articles with links so they'll take you straight to the article and there's even podcasts so if you or, or uh, like to listen to podcasts there's all sorts of resources available to you that will help support those needs. And then also we've provided a handout to do and not to do when you're writing your dissertation and writing resources, which again, I can't express enough how wonderful that handout is. So print those out, keep them with you when you're writing your dissertation, you keep them downloaded on your computer. And also in just a couple of weeks, on September 26th, we're gonna be doing a second part to this dissertation series that will talk all about actually writing the dissertation and some practical strategies to help print in your writing for the dissertation. So if you haven't already signed up for that, then that would be another uh, resource that would I would recommend and just just use all of this to do one thing better add one thing to your repertoire one thing you can change or one thing you can stop worrying about one thing you can talk through with either your professor or your chair if you're already at that stage 
to try to chip away at the big anxiety aspect of this so you can get down to the work of it. And if you work in increments, you focus on time, if you get help, if you diagnose early, and if you center yourself emotionally about the importance of your work, you're going to get through it. And we will be here to guide you as you go through it. So now if we have uh, um, some questions, we're happy to, happy to take your questions. And our contact info is at the end as well, and we'll, we'll continue with uh, questions. If you have them, feel free to reach out to either one of us. Thank you both for your thoughtful and thorough presentation. This is a lot of valuable information for our current doctoral students who are in the dissertation phase, or even for doctoral students who are preparing to enter the dissertation phase, or even if you're considering a doctoral program, what's involved in completing a dissertation. Um, Daniel, I'm certain this content's generated some questions, so I'll turn it over to you to facilitate the Q&A between our attendees and our presenters. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the great presentation, everyone. And we actually, we have quite a few questions. And those of you who do have something on your mind, uh, as a reminder, you can submit your questions in the control panel, on, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and we're going to start off the Q&A with uh, something from actually a, a familiar name. Uh, and I'm going to direct this to Dr. Deegan to start on. Okay. How important is it to have a good peer network? And do you have any strategies connecting with other EDD students? Yeah, a couple of strategies. I, I was really fortunate to go through my doctoral program with a cohort. And I say, just about on a daily basis, I thank my cohort, right? I, I feel like I couldn't do it without them. So in Trident, we don't have a true cohort. So what I've tried to do with my students is connect them, get them on a conference call. In the EDD program, we have a Facebook page. But some of these things you can do ad hoc. I, every time on the discussion board, I see students typing in saying, oh, hey, Jane, I recognize you from another class. But I don't get the sense that they're truly connecting. So I take the, 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 the tact of encouraging them to really connect. And you all can see each other's email. You can arrange to connect off, off loop. But especially as you approach the dissertation process, the feeling that you're all alone in it is really a, a, an unfortunate one and a dysfunctional one. So anything you can do to form an ad hoc network or join some of the networks that we have already provided in your course, in the Facebook page, or others, and ask your, ask your chair, can you connect me with other dissertating students or whatever, just to have that dialogue back and forth. It, I think it's absolutely essential. Even if their topics are very different, even if their approach, they're doing stats, you're doing qual, it doesn't matter. Nobody in your life will know what you're going through, but your classmates, they really don't. Even if your spouse already went through a, a doctoral program, they just don't know what it feels like and all that internal churning that's going on as you try to juggle a million plates. So relying on your classmates, even just to commiserate, is incredibly valuable. The great news is, they're fellow scholars and they've got a lot of tips and a lot of context and a lot of insights and things they've been through that they could guide you as well in addition to the advice you're getting from your team. So I highly recommend that. And I, I have one thing to add to that as well. You, may, you mentioned the Facebook page um, and I would like to mention one specifically for EDD uh, students because that was a part of the question I think was EDD in particular. A classmate of mine a couple of years ago already started one called Trident EDD students and it's all students no professors just students um, I, I'm in there there's quite a few of us in there that are finishing up or maybe have just finished but it is open to anybody that would like the support and then it's kind of just a safe place to ask questions and so I I would encourage that you search Trident EDD students and request in and that's just kind of another network that you can have uh, to support you throughout your process uh, great thank you and Another question, this one's for you, Dr. Roman Murphy, but how far into the program, if the dissertation process hasn't started, should I change what I want to do my dissertation on? If it hasn't, okay, so I can, I can kind of answer that with a real life uh, situation that happened. I, I had chosen a topic and, and it was still the topic I wanted, but it wasn't as focused as it should have been. I wanted to explore the perspectives of all sorts of stakeholders about inclusive special education uh, initially. And then I remember, and it, it was a class just prior to starting the dissertation series, and the conversation, my very first conversation I ever had with Dr. Deegan, because she was a professor in that class, 
And she said, it's too big. She gave me the talk about that's a Dr. Dr. Romanuk study. You know, this is a student. And emotionally, that was that was tough. That was tough to hear because it really required me to completely change the focus of my study and to completely hone in on a different body of research. But guess what? That's okay, especially if you haven't started your dissertation already. If it's not the right fit, if you're not passionate about it, if there's too many logistical issues, if the topic's too big, it's okay. You can come back, especially with some guidance, and change the topic. It'll be okay. It feels like a lot of work on the front end, but you've still got a year, three years to go. So don't be afraid of that if that is the best choice when you consider all the logistical issues and what you're wanting to do for the next one to three years. And I would say when the, when your chair is pushing you to scale your study back or, or morph it into this or that, you have to have the rapport and that trust that it's for your benefit. I'm not trying to fit you into my interests. I'm not trying to make you use a methodology that I love and I'm comfortable with. I'm trying to for you to get done with a study of great academic and scholarly value. So when I'm saying, mm, what about this? What about trying to push you? I would just encourage all students to to consider the source of that advice. It's somebody who's on your side, who's on your team, who's trying to get you through with research of great value. And the, the, the incredible dreams you had of what you might want to do are still available to you in the future. But the more you fight that, we're going to end up with a doable study at the end of the day. We have to because we have to get done. So the more you trust in that conversation, the further along you'll be. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Smith, uh, next question is for you. Uh, during the chair selection process, is there any sort of guide available and what attributes they have uh, so I know who to choose for a successful dissertation? Uh, within the EDD program, we do have a list of faculty, both full-time and part-time, who are willing to serve as dissertation chairs, and many of them have experience with chairing. Um, we do have a few faculty just based on their workload who prefer just to be committee members, so that would be noted on the list as well. When it comes to selecting someone who you feel will be successful, we've kind of already done that for you by providing the list and making sure that our, our chairs are trained and understand what the expectations are and how to help a student progress through the dissertation. And I think oftentimes it's okay as a doctoral student to kind of go with your gut and see which chair you connect with, and it's okay to have multiple conversations. Yeah. One, of the, um, one of the things that we used to say when I was in my doctoral program is it's kind of like asking someone to prom, you know? You want to think <laughs> it through, you want to make sure it's a good choice, you know? And so it's similar to that, you know? You get to know somebody, and that's what you're going to base your decision on. Uh, a lot of it has to do with that working relationship more so than anything else. And I say no when I can't help. Usually it's about time. I don't, I don't just load up and, you know, then I can't give my students time. I mean, I do my best to manage that. And when we have a, a bunch of students that graduate, then I have more availability. And as far as I know, I serve on many committees in addition to chairing. And I see my colleagues doing the same type of thing. So you reaching out and having those conversations is what you're supposed to do. And you, you have the expectation, rightly so, that you'll get a, a, a truthful response from the potential chair about their availability and their ability to assist your work. And if you're having trouble finding a chair, the, the doctoral studies director, that's part of their role. They'll help you identify a chair that's suitable if you're having a hard time connecting with people or need more ideas about who to reach out to. That's part of our, you know, part of the support that we offer. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question is, is for Dr. Deegan. You spoke about this earlier in the presentation, but can you explain exactly what a topic match is? A topic match is if... Uh, if the chair that you're looking at has had a long career in you know, special education teacher, special education administrator, and now they're teaching at Trident, and your topic is special education, the instinct might be, well, I need to work with that person because they're the ones that are going to understand special education. When I was uh, uh, Dr. Ramanak Murphy's chair and her topic was special education, I've never worked in special education, right? So you don't have to have an exact topic match. Um, certainly everyone under the, in the College of Ed has an understanding of public education. Uh, the difference between higher ed and K-12 is a little bit, a bit of a nuanced thing, but they'll be able to guide both. So you don't need an exact topic match. If you can find one, that might be more helpful.
but a topic match I think shouldn't be privileged over a working relationship with the chair, working styles that mesh, a sense that you're going to get the support you need in the way in which you need it from that person versus they're in my field, so I have to work with them. Because if you don't mesh, if your styles are, are not compatible, then that's going to be a challenge. So I wouldn't limit yourself to only topic match. If it's there, certainly ask about the topic. We all disclose you know, certain things about our backgrounds and what we've, inter what we've researched before. So I would look for it. I wouldn't ignore it. But I don't feel like you're left out if you can't find somebody who has a long career of expertise in the exact area you're, you're working in. And I think that's, that's going to be pretty rare, especially in an EDD program and an applied program. Um, we're all going to have long careers doing many, many things, and the insight into, into all kinds of topics is there. In PhD, it might be more necessary that there's more of a match, but again, in that exact match, I'm doing this, you've done that, I think doesn't have to happen. Thank you. Um, Dr. Murphy, this next question is for you. And I know you, you touched on a little bit of it before, but uh, how long did it take you to complete your dissertation after being, uh, uh, being assigned a chair? And, and what would have saved you time or allowed you to complete it quicker? Um, so with mine, I did do my program quite quickly. And that was because I was living overseas and I had more time than I would have had if I was working full time back in the States. So I really wanted to get it done. And so I will say that I did my dissertation within eight or nine months, which is fast. Um, I didn't have any breaks in between the dissertation series, but I don't think it would have been a bad idea to have a semester where I would have had maybe just a regular class between maybe the last two semesters, because that would have given me more time. What would have um, enabled me to do it more quickly? Okay. so. I did run into some challenges and I was cutting it close when it came to defending. Like I'm talking like five days I was completing things. Um, it was it was a mad rush to the end because unforeseen things do come up and you can't plan for everything. I think that's the whole the whole point. That's why I say be proactive whenever you can and get ahead whenever you can. So I don't know in my certain circumstance that anything would have saved me time. But some of the things that I ran into time-wise, consideration-wise, that you could run into, uh, for me, I didn't have enough participants right off the bat. So I had to go back to IRB and actually amend my study to include a different group of stakeholders, which that was scary because I had a couple of months left. I mean, really, truly, you're going, oh, my gosh, if I had a semester in between those last two dissertation series classes, I probably would have had a little bit of a relief, a sigh of relief. So that is something I might recommend if you, if you have the time in your program to laid out that way. Uh, another thing I ran into was not securing all the sites that I wanted to because of various different reasons uh, where I couldn't conduct research with the districts that I wanted to. And so that was another panic attack mode. Uh, and these things do happen. So just be proactive and get ahead where you can. Don't stress about it, but know that these things do come up and that's okay. And do allow yourself some additional time if you can schedule a break. Uh, in semesters, like a semester break between two dissertation series classes where you can do a regular class in between. And I'm not entirely sure, but I think that if need be, you can extend. Is that correct? If you do run out of time and these things happen to you, timing-wise, you can extend the semester out. Is that right to continue with research? Yeah. So I just I would just want to clarify that uh, Dr. Romanoff Murphy is talking specifically about the EDD program in that the way our courses are sequenced, you can uh, space out the dissertation series courses in between taking concentration classes in your last year of the program. So that's not an option in uh, the other doctoral programs. They go into dissertation and they remain in dissertation until they complete. And we all, across all our programs, do offer dissertation continuation. So those are the ones that allow you to add additional sessions so that you can extend your time to complete your study. Okay. And I think this is where things like framing the study logistically, if you want to interview K-12 teachers and you're ready to go in June, well, they're all gone in June. They're on summer break and you're not going to get them till September, maybe after the beginning of school starts. So going as quickly as humanly possible how do i get it quickly is usually not the conversation we want to have but what your goals are and what your logistics are what your life is are you transferring a year from now are you having a baby or you know all those kinds of things that's where the communication comes in and we can map out a program that will work for you but we always have to include that 
that piece of time for the unanticipated things that happen to virtually every student. And they're not all tragic, they're just, they cost time. So that's, that. you know, speed is one thing and going through it quickly is, is the goal or as quick as possible, but you have to let this thing steep. Sometimes it takes you longer to get to your track and you wanna switch your focus just because now you've evolved with the literature and then as well the logistical thing. So time is something we can control when we plan for it in advance and with having that buffer to be able to recover from, from, from switches or changes or, or evolutions or whatever um, is the best advice I can give rather than speed. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Smith, does the, com the, does the committee have to be all faculty of Trident and how many people should be on the committee? Uh, and I'm going to turn this into a two-parter because the person asked about PhD, but I want to include um, the professional doctorates in there as well. Yeah, this is the case across all the programs. Uh, we need at least three committee members minimum, two of which need to be faculty here at Trident. They can be full-time or part-time. And for the third spot, you do have the option of having an external expert be on the committee. However, you do have to confirm that they have a terminal degree and um, that they have expertise in the field that matches your topic of study. So there is some flexibility there. They don't have to all be from Trident. Most of our students, though, do end up with uh, a committee that's made up of all Trident faculty. Thank you. And uh, next one is also for you, Dr. Smith. Um, uh, I've enjoyed the dialogue from all the panelists today, thank you, and I understand that you present it from an EDD perspective. As an organizational leadership student, I'm assuming in the PhD in business administration program, uh, should I direct my request for assistance through the school of business or, or elsewhere? Yes, you're in the DBA program or the PhD BA program, you would want to contact the director, Dr. Indira Guzman. She can help you with your dissertation phase or any questions you have. Um, if you're in College of Health Sciences or PhD in Health Science, you want to direct your questions to Dr. Ryan Dwight. And if you're in College of Education with EDD, um, I'm the one who can help you. And Dr. Wenling Lee is the director for the PhD in Educational Leadership. Thank you. And last question we have, uh, and I'm gonna send this your way, Dr. Deegan, is, uh, is there access to a statistician during the dissertation process? Well, if I were your chair, I would have to help you find one. I'm not a statistician, so we would have a committee member that would have those strengths, but these are things we'd have to map out in advance. If you came to me and said, Dr. Deegan, would you be my chair? And here's the study I have in mind, I would know. Well, this is something I'm gonna need assistance with or you'll need additional expertise with. And before we, we would go forward, we would get those people in place, we'd see. Um, that's how I would handle it. I think other chairs would do the same. To, to, to specifically look for a chair that has that statistical analysis, that, that would be a place where your, where your doctoral director or your dean can give you some advice about people that in EDD we have a list or some other people where you can put that team together and sort of test your hypothesis or test your approach with people before you get it all together. Because it's not just writing down names and now we're good, we're sealed forever. It's a, it's a journey, it's a process. And um, I would not be comfortable saying, I'll, I'll be happy to be your chair, knowing that I don't have that specific expertise that you may need. I could take you three quarters of the way through, but the, the, the last quarter, I wouldn't be able to do it. So I would feel incumbent on me to bring that expertise in place first before we set the committee. And I think that would be pretty similar to other people. Thank you, and okay, well that wraps our questions for uh, for today. Thank you everyone for your questions. I'm gonna hand things off to Dr. Smith to close out the webinar today. Thank you everybody for attending and participating in our core webinar, Developing a Dissertation, Practical Tips for Success. You can visit the core webpage to learn more about this series and access more doctoral resources. Uh, special thanks again to Daniel and Lena from Marketing Department and all of our attendees for your participation, interest, and great questions. Let's continue building our knowledge. Our next core webinar is on September 26th, and it's the second part to today's presentation. A sign-up link can be found in the chat box. 
If you would like to reach out to today's presenters or myself, our contact information is on the screen. Thanks again for attending. Goodbye and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Norman Murphy. Thank you, Dan. Thank you both.